I was terrified. <laughs> but he never said anything. I said, you said nothing. He said, let me tell you a story. When I was a young man, he told us, I was in a whites-only township in the Free State. And a police officer came up to me, and you'll have to excuse my Afrikaans, it's not very good. And he said to me, Kafir, van dag jy sal kak. And Mandela responded by saying, nobody tells me where to shit. <laughs> I had to get over hearing that word come out of Nelson Mandela's mouth. And once I got over that, I said, so you were always very brave. He said, no, I pretended to be brave. Because courage is not the absence of fear, but it is how you choose to deal with your fears. It is not fearlessness, but it is how you choose to deal with your fears. And the more you pretend to be brave, the braver you become. And it's so true, isn't it? So we all have things to deal with, whether it's personally in our work lives, politically, in any area. And we can all choose to be courageous. We can all choose to deal with our fears. It's not that they're not there. Believe you me, when I go into violence-torn townships and war zones, I'm terrified. At best, I'm hiding behind a car and sticking out a mic and hoping that I'll get sound somehow to take back to the office. It's how you choose to deal with your fears, because we are a courageous nation. We're also a compassionate nation, my fourth point. And I want to share another story. Unfortunately, all my stories begin a bit dismally. My eldest daughter said that every time she watches me on television, it's very depressing because nothing nice ever comes out of my mouth. Couldn't I try and be a little more cheerful, she said. I said, I can do cheerful. I tried. During the World Cup, I did cheerful, and nobody watched the show. But <laughs> so it's back to doom and gloom. This is a story about the worst case of child abuse this country has ever seen. Three children aged between two and ten. Their father used them for target practice. The tools that should have been kept in the shed were kept in the house, and the children slept in the tool shed. They, left, they ate the leftover pig's food, and they were allowed to run free because they'd never been registered. They were never sent to school. They were subjected to the most hideous sexual abuse by both parents. It was absolutely horrendous. Now, we got involved in the story because a nosy neighbor contacted us, and we literally had to drag the police kicking and screaming to this house. And eventually, they arrested the couple, and the mother turned state witness, because although she participated in the abuse, she herself had also been abused. And she testified against her husband, and they were sent to jail. Again, that's how justice should work. But you had a problem. You had three children left as a result of this terrible case. And let me tell you, before any of you harbor any romantic notions about abused children, they are not nice children. These were terrible children. They would go to school and they would steal everybody's lunch. They'd steal everything, in fact, cell phones, you name it, because they'd never seen food like that in their lives before. They were wild, they were unruly, they were ungovernable, and they were sexually promiscuous, which is often a hallmark of abused children. You wouldn't want one of them in your home, let alone all three. But do you know that after we broadcast that show, not one, not ten, not dozens, but hundreds, hundreds of South Africans volunteered to foster these children. We were able to give the authorities lists of names of families that wanted to foster these children. And they were able to pick a remarkable family. And those children were kept together as a family unit because the temptation in cases like that is to split them because it's easier. And four years later, they're still together with this family, whose name I can't even tell you because we have to protect the children's identity. But there they are. They have the one thing, the one thing that this family had to give that doesn't cost money, and that is love, because South Africans are a compassionate nation. <laughs> We're also a nation that knows how to persevere. And here I'm going to share another story with you. Um, you heard that I covered Nelson Mandela from the time he was released to the time he became president, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. But first, about the time that I was uncovering Nelson Mandela's inauguration, in fact, on the day that he was being inaugurated, another story was unfolding in South Africa. A young mother gave birth to her first child, and it was a wonderful experience. She battled to fall pregnant. She finally fell pregnant. She had a premature baby, an emergency cesarean, but finally, a beautiful baby girl was born. Now, any of you who are mothers in this audience will know, you know, we study for years to get our degrees. 
you have a baby and they say, take it home and just make sure it doesn't die. And you know nothing, right, about looking after a baby, let alone how to bath it. So when a young Red Cross nurse came to this young mother and said, may I borrow your baby for a baby bath? Of course, she only too happily handed her child over. And that was the last she would see of her child, baby Michaela. Remember, she was stolen, one day old. And do you know what the police said? They said, we can't investigate until she's been missing for 24 hours. Of course, as a result of that case, in fact, the law changed. Now, I had been covering Nelson Mandela's inauguration, and then the Rwandan genocide broke, so I got sent to cover that. I came back three weeks later, baby Michaela was still missing. My editor at the time, who was Jeremy Maggs, I'm now his boss, be nice to those below you, um, said to me, I think you should go and cover the story. I said, Jeremy, look, you know, no clues in the first 24 hours, that's the best time to get clues. Three weeks since the baby's been missing, you and I know missing babies do not get found. I said, I've just got a feeling, go and meet the hunters. And so I went and met Bruce and Alison Hunter. And I became obsessed with the story. We got wind through all these clues that somehow some child prostitution racket was involved. The child protection unit was very corrupt at the time, and these prostitutes were having babies and selling them on the black market. It was a whole big thing. So I walked the streets of Hillbrow to talk to all these prostitutes, got mistaken for a prostitute, got offered less than the going rate, <laughs> decided I'd stick to my day job at 702, one dead end after another. And this went on for about a year, and we really gave it our all. So I then, after about a year, went to my boss, still Jeremy Maggs, and said to him, I think we need to help the hunters get closure. And I was young, and I was arrogant, and I didn't have children of my own, which is really my only excuse. And so off I went, and I gave my little talk to the hunters about closure. And Bruce Hunter looked at me, and he said, how dare you? How dare you stand before me and tell me to give up? How dare you tell me to stop persevering? How dare you tell me to not have hope? Because for as long as I live, I will never, ever stop looking for my child. And if you don't want to be part of this investigation, that's fine. But do not tell me to give up. And it was a powerful lesson for a young journalist, especially one with aspirations of being an investigative reporter. Because investigations take a long time before they see the light of day. And so we went back and we carried on looking for baby Michaela. And shortly before her second birthday, she was found. Now the odds of that are virtually zero. <coughs> Missing babies, it is true, do not get found. But baby Michaela was found because the hunters never gave up. Because we are a nation that does not give up. That is what it means to be South African. We're also an entrepreneurial nation. Testament to everybody here. Italians who have come here and started amazing businesses because South Africans know about the art of the possible. Amongst other things, and you'll know some of these, we invented open heart surgery, the CAT scan, the creepy crawly, the sound of suburbia, barbed wire, only in South Africa, <laughs> prattly putty, which was used to hold bits of the Apollo 11 mission's eagle landing craft together, We've had to find solutions, and they may be flawed solutions. Think of CADESA, our negotiations process that resulted in our constitution. It was a flawed process. I was there, I covered it. And believe you me, most decisions were made at three in the morning with the politicians sipping Bioplus. And it was really, the decision went in the favor of whichever party could hold it out the longest. And in those days, it was the ANC, because, you know, I don't know, when you're in government, you get fat and tired and lazy, and so the Nats used to fall asleep a lot quicker. So they just gave in all the time. Think of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, a truly unique South African solution to stop the bloodletting in this country. And yes, it's flawed. It gave us a skewed sense of justice because people forgot that amnesty has to stop at some point. You can't keep asking for it. Sheikh should learn a lesson or two from that. The point is that we've had to find unique solutions to unique South African problems. I think of my own experience. We launched a news station at ETV, E! News, in 1998, and everyone said we couldn't do it because the SABC was this giant. You all used to sit down at 8 o'clock and watch the SABC News, remember? Gillian van Houten's hairdos, her marriage to John Barty, Ellen Erasmus. It was part of our daily lives, whether or not you thought the news was good. 
So we decided to launch our news at 7 o'clock. And everyone said, that's a terrible time. No one's going to watch. Well, four years after we launched, SABC was forced to move its primetime bulletin to 7 o'clock to compete with us. They said it was for all sorts of other reasons, but we know better because we are an entrepreneurial nation. And on the back of that, we were able to launch a 24-hour news service. And again, everyone said it couldn't be done and that if we did do it, we'd have to hire inter international consultants, which we didn't. We visited international networks around the world, saw what they did right, saw what they did wrong, and launched a truly unique South African service, which is now the most watched news service on the DSTV bouquet, because South Africans know what South Africans want. We are an entrepreneurial nation, and that is really what we're celebrating here tonight. My seventh reason is that we are a nation that creates heroes and heroines in the most unlikely of places, and I want you to consider the following. You can't get AIDS if you touch, hug, kiss, or hold hands with someone who is infected. Care for us, accept us. We are all human beings. We are normal, we have hands, we have feet, we can walk, we can talk, we have needs like everyone else. We are all the same. Do not be afraid of us. Do you remember who said that? Little and Corsi Johnson, 11 years old, at the International World AIDS Conference nine years ago in Durban. An 11-year-old boy stood on a platform and told the emperor he had no clothes on. It took an 11-year-old child to tell Tabo Mbeki, we have AIDS. It exists in my body. And if you do not give HIV pregnant mother ARVs, we are facing an epidemic of pandemic proportions an 11-year-old boy. And a year later, when Nkosi Johnson died, and he shouldn't have died because his mother should have got ARVs, he said to me, you know, Deborah, I just want to be remembered for having made a difference. So it just, you know, such stabbed me in the heart when he said that. And I thought, what an incredible difference in his little 12 years this boy made. How much more of a difference can we make in our lives with our health, with our wealth, with our access to resources, because this is a nation that creates heroes and heroines in the most unlikely of places. And the next one could be you. Which brings me to my eighth point. This is a country that creates remarkable children. Of course, I think mine are great. I have two girls. 